All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, here we are. Here we are. I'm trying to get the chat room up on Foxhole because I want to be able to see everybody there. I also have the wonderful DLive chat. It is the final session of actual reading. I know that we might do some follow-up so. stuff afterwards, but is the final session of the first assembly of the Quite Frankly Book Club. And it has been so amazingly co-hosted by Timothy Gordon. And here we are again, Tim. I know that you are on limited time tonight because you are doing a uh, book club session for Father Elijah, which I only read because of your suggestion. And I loved it, so I have to keep up some way with what you're doing with that book. But uh, welcome, welcome tonight, my friend. Thanks, my friend. And uh, again, thank you all. Um, the, the, the frankly is out there. You, you just have one of the best audiences. One, of, I think one of the best shows. Thank you. Uh, pound for pound out there. One of the only ones I actually pay attention to with any regularity, and I've just been thrilled to uh, have been uh, in the cockpit with you, Frank. That oh. sounds a little uh, strange. Well, but... hey, listen, we are in the Millennium oh, Falcon. Right. This is the Millennium Falcon over here. There's more than two seats. So we are, we are, yes, we have been co-piloting this excursion. It's been really a great time. And a lot of our regulars are in the chat rooms already. And let's just, just jump into it because I don't want to waste any time. Um, I did, thankfully, I didn't have as many notes as I did in other times because it's been a, a, short, a short little thing here. And uh, a lot of it can be summed up pretty quickly. But... Um, Starting off on page 605, we went 605 until the end. It opens up with Christian Gladstone working out a strategy to get out of Rome to intercept the Pope before he is made to sign that resignation paper and to show him what he discovered about the enthronement ritual, which, as it turns out, the Pope did not know about. Um, and Giovanni Lucadamo gets Christian out eventually uh ultimately gets christian out of rome with the help of apple yard so that's uh that was nice to see him throw a little bit of uh escape support down at the end there um the rats on the other hand they have everything ready to go the media was ready to announce the resignation uh uh and since they have all the cardinals meeting in that consistory at the same time the plan is to transform it into a conclave once monsignor vachi chorus i think monsignor vachi chorus gets the signature from the pope in moscow and that is the last that's the last uh, stop that he has in this trip and that's where he starts showing a little bit of the chinks in his armor. He's getting a little bit fatigued in Moscow, and they're trying to turn it into a, does he have a stroke? Uh, we have to get him out. Um, that's how the stage is set. I would like to jump real quick to something I saw on page 608, because we were always talking about Mastriani and his complicity with the whole thing, and I did not know what the hell to make of this. Mm -mm, me neither. So here it is. This is from four paragraphs down or something. He was tempted to leave a note. This was about Christian. This was about Christian. Should he be able to tell Mastriani about what he found and all that stuff? He was tempted to leave a note for Mastriani that would upset the smooth timetable he and his colleagues had worked out. But it was swiftly a passing thought. Nothing, Chris realized, would turn Mastriani back now. Not even knowledge of the enthronement ceremony. Uh, not even the fact that his closest colleagues had hitched a ride on his agenda for an unspeakable reasons. The unspeakable reasons, of course, being the, 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 the willful communion with the ancient adversary of Satan. So when I read that, I'm saying to myself, so Mastroianni wasn't down with the satanic aspect of this cause? He was just maybe a, an ardent globalist that had had his faith rooked of him? Uh... That that that's that made me question everything I had thought. Yeah, it was weird, and I, I went back and I reviewed Frank what uh, what it said in the last pages of the sixth century of this book in the late five nineties mm -hmm. on the June 29, nineteen sixty three, the insurance policy between Carnesecca and the popes. Uh, it turns out that that Mastroianni's name wasn't on the right. uh, Rolodex of Evil or whatever you want to call it. 
and yet he's even ambiguous there. I don't know if this has something to do with Malachi Martin's authorial... I, I don't know what. The, the, it has something to do with the nature of the way that he's penning the faction. I think he purposely made Mastroianni vague, not, not so much as a literary device, but as an author who didn't know what to make of it. Because uh, I, I don't have the exact page here. It's in the 590s. Uh, I was looking for it. Agrees no pope will be able to govern the church through Vatican until... Uh, it's, it's a big deal. Right. And the two places where he's saying that Mastroianni was not part of the enthronement of Satan on June 29th, 1963, um, he, he's, he really gives us ambivalent language. He wasn't a part of it, though, and he might not even have known about it. He, you know, on page six of eight, really odd. Seems like he, he threw that in because he didn't know as an author what to do with uh, the former uh, Cardinal's Secretary of State before Cardinal Sedano. See, I don't know where it was in the, because it was probably hundreds of pages in the past now, but I think something else that I, that I remember from the book that, that brings me back to this is um, in many ways, I, I don't know if it was in silent reflection of one of the characters like Christian or or if it was a uh, an exchange between Christian and Slattery or O'Neill and Slattery or anything like that when he was still in the States. But there was a, a, a talk about that differential between those who are actually acting out as avowed Luciferians and those who have just been accustomed and brought into the um brought into the habit of luciferian thinking and i and i started thinking satanic thinking i you know for example where the hell is it uh let me see it's it's toward the end i guess we'll get there but you see a lot of pride a lot of pride in masteriani in these chapters here so if he's not uh if he's not down with Satan, then he he certainly has taken on taken on that satanic uh, pride and that frustration and, and really thinking highly of themselves and the worship of the self and their and and of course what their place in the world is and how much they are going to be venerated for making a new world and all that. So it's, I guess this is just the 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 final the final judgment on Mastroianni. I thought that yeah yeah maybe he wasn't old enough to be part of the in, the enthronement ceremony and have his name in those papers but he was certainly part of the lodge crew so uh, there's that now we have on 611 what is expressed to be a deep poignant sadness of the pope who ha now who is in the last stop in Moscow he has yet to see a sign from heaven. And this is where he starts showing signs of fatigue, and you have that um, you have that Monsignor Jan um, uh, Mikulik, who is such a vulture, waiting, waiting. On, on page six thirteen, there he is again. He says, uh, "But Doctor Mikulik wasn't about to accept such a benign diagnosis of of the Pope just being fatigued a little bit. With time running out, he couldn't afford to. He couldn't afford to accept a benign diagnosis. He needed something that was bad enough." to trigger the resignation. Quote, isn't it possible that His Holiness has suffered a slight stroke or, uh, or some kind of ischemic attack? Uh, so here you have him trying to make every molehill into a mountain and just mm -hmm. hovering, hovering and floating around, flitting around like a vulture. Uh, again, where the heck did I put it here? In medieval times. Oh, man. Eh... I forget where I where the last of it is. So they move the Pope to a secluded monastery in his home nation of Poland. And it is here where there is another there's the one piece of divine intervention, I guess you can call it, where there it is ordered that there is a grand silence that needs to be undertaken in this monastery. And this Jan Mikulik, who has been, you know, really all over the Pope and trying to be a, a big part of his final ouster, he is put into a seclusion in his own room and everybody's supposed to be secluded and silent which keeps him at bay a little bit and then uh we have we have um an entire page on page uh, 625 just moving along uh page 625 where you have the media an entire 
entire page of the media that is out there pushing the fact that the Pope has resigned for one reason or another, and all different sects and all different uh, uh, groups inside of the Catholic Church that were either po or anti-papal were were you know drawing one conclusion or another just to show how this media war continues on and on and on. Um, but Mastriani, as I said, while this is all going on. There's a lot of this going on, a lot of filler with this, and just looking at how people are waiting out these final times and really, really um, important phases of this plan. Masteriani on page th- well, 30, uh, 632, again, here's the pride. If he doesn't outright, if he's not outright worshiping Satan, he sure is satanic with his self-worship. A lot of pride, and here we have... He began to at last understand how it felt to be counted among history's chosen few, to be one of the world's master engineers. He was talking about that. Uh, Do not trouble yourself, eminence, he went on. The the Camerlingo cooed to the cactus. Well before our historic consistory opens at noon, we will be in possession of the fully signed and duly sealed resignation protocol. His Excellency has everything in hand. And again, on page 365... He uh, 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 three uh, 635 I should say he shows that kind of um, that kind of spirit hang on to your nerves Cosimo his eminence straightened his mind with a quick really uh, reality check plans have been well laid crowds or no Vachi uh, Vachi chorus will get through that's the monsignor that's supposed to that actually is supposed to go out there as a nuncio to get this resignation and make it dead they want they want the papacy gone they want to turn that consistory into a conclave and move on to continue decentralizing the uh, the entire church and uh, and using it for whatever globalist ends that they have committed themselves to crowds are no the pope isn't going anywhere he's boxed in he will sign meanwhile his initials on the protocol and his unprotesting retirement to jasna gora can lead to only one conclusion he has clearly acquiesced in the council's decision that his latest physical weakness was an indication of papal incapacitation um camerlengo removed his hand from the telephone that this is um masriani he says, just hang on to your nerves, he said, and remember who's in charge here. So that's just that's just what's going on. Time and time again, we get a little bit of the uh, the mind the mind into this. But now, you have anything up until this point, um, Tim? Because I'm just moving along, so I can do most of this with you on air with me. Yeah, I mean, just just so people know out there, the camera lingo is uh in charge during interregnums you know during set of uh they're saying that it's because anytime you have the death of a pope or i guess in the case of benedict slash john paul ii retirement of a pope he's saying i'm in charge and i i know that's what you're pointing out but people people might be like what's what is this camera lango business um to me the largest and most stark eureka moment of the entire novel is something that keeps resounding these last 60 pages partly at the end of last reading partly at the beginning of this one the murderer of uh of the priest from early the the ritual sacrifice is one of the three most papabile and that is cardinal uh oretini who is in real life Cardinal Silvestrini, who is part of the uh, Sancta Gallen Mafia, and he's one of the three most papabile. As this consistory becomes a, a conclave, he's one of the three guys that's most likely to be Pope, and he's a real guy. And at the time, no one knew what the Sancta Gallen Mafia was, that this book was written, and he's one of the absolute, along with the, the Cardinal of Century City, who is Cardinal Bernadine, he's one of the absolute most satanic of the Satanists, and that's wild. Like, this guy planned, we know for a fact, the Francis Pontificate. Uh, he was kind of number two. So uh, to me, that's just wild. Yeah, I, I know I said that last week, but it sat on me again. I just put Silvestrini's, uh, Silvestrini's Wikipedia page up on, up on the, uh, the screen right now, just so people can get a, a, a view of him. And he just died in 2019, it says. 
Oh, yeah, he did just die. Okay, okay, so he doesn't still live. But, I mean, he planned the fr- the, the, the the guy that was the first in charge of the Salt Gallen Mafia that was really stumping hard for Pope Francis at the 2013 conclave and the 2005 conclave was uh, uh, Cardinal Martini, who's a smaller character in this, one of the bad guys. But he got sick. He got Parkinson's, like JP2, whom he hated, ironically. And he kind of, he was really papable. He was on on the cover of Time Magazine in the late 90s. They thought he was going to be the guy in 2005, but he had Parkinson's. The next guy that took over the Sankt Gallen Mafia was Cardinal Silvestrini. He's the murderer guy himself. Um, and super, super, super at the core of the satanic stuff. So that, to me, you just can't get around that. I've no. forgotten he died, but... Um, and, and not too long ago, he held on. Almost 100 years old. He said he was born in 23. So wow. so in, 60, in 63, he would have been uh, in the prime of his life. Right, right. Wow. Yeah, so he was 40 and then died at 96. Yeah, that is just, just wild, wildness. Um, that that just kept hit, sitting on me as I was reading the first pages, uh, the first half of this reading here. I, I, I just could, I couldn't believe it. Well, you know, and, and as we go forward, it, it says here, because I said before, the, the, the Pope was feeling this kind of really poignant level of sadness because really the whole the whole idea was I'm going to Russia and Ukraine I'm going to Poland I'm going to that whole area over there in, in the eastern in Eastern Europe and I want to uh, I just want to be among the people and I want to wait for a sign there was really no plan the plan was to be out there to know that everybody is uh, is 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 really plotting behind your back and to be out there and to be open for a sign from heaven and he wasn't getting it but there was something that I started seeing as a sign and then, of course, it was uh, it was paid attention to by others in the book as well. I forget which characters. The traffic and the crowds. All of a sudden, the traffic out there in Poland and the crowds that are coming to see the Holy Father there in this monastery as he, um, you know, it's like his papacy and the history of the world seems to be dangling on a string. The crowds, they are making it impossible for this Monsignor Vachy Koros I'm probably saying his name horribly, to make his way to the Pope in time. He's struggling. He wants to complete the coup. He wants to get the resignation. And he is as well is very focused on his place in history for being the one to gain the signature, the first resigned Pope since the 14th century. And um, and still, I, I was saying to myself, man, the traffic, the crowds the, the, the that are mounting outside the monastery, that was the sign from heaven. That this wasn't supposed. You, you needed to at least get some time for Christian to show up and talk about what's going on. Now, there's another little time, a little piece here that's a little bit unrelated to everything, but just the imagery struck me. It's on page three sixty six six thirty six. Um, and thousands more will come, my friend. Abbot Cordeki came beside Damien. I've seen this happen before on the on one of his earliest visits here as Pope. It was the height of his clash with the Stalinist government of Poland, and he was overnighting there. Then, too, the people began to assemble spontaneously around Jasna Gora Hill. Standing on the same balcony, His Holiness never made a formal speech. Every so often he gave his blessing or made some gesture with his hands, much as he's doing now, but never once lost control of those crowds. That's the way it was with him, the way it is with him. The Stalinists never had seen anything like it. Few people have. They threw a, re- a steel ring around this place, called, it, uh, called in an entire armored division, but still the people came. A million and a half flocked in from all over Poland. They flooded the tanks with their sheer numbers. They laid down in front of them, squatted on top of them, blocked their caterpillar treads, draped flowers on them, poured holy water down their gun muzzles, recited the rosary in their turrets, uh, on their turrets. They nullified them, rendered them pointless. It was something to see, Father Slattery. The way that those bull, uh, bully boys withdrew with the crowds jeering and cheering and chanting hymns at them. When I read that, once again, it brought me back to the imagery that I have, uh, I have brought up and, and shown on my show so many times, and that is The Night on Bald Mountain from the original release of Disney's Fantasia. Now, the night on Bald Mountain, if you remember, 
it is um i think i think his name is uh, demibog or some the, the 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 demon uh you can a satanic figure is comes alive on the top of the mountain and starts harassing and tormenting this very quiet sleepy little mountain town and just sets the hounds of hell and every every ghoul uh in in hell onto this sleepy mountain town and it seems like a hopeless situation it's just they're surrounded the valley is completely swarmed by these ghouls and then finally finally at the peak of the chaos there is a single church bell that chimes and with every church bell that chimes these these they 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 are pained by it and they are slowly receding back into their graves and then what comes in to vanquish all of that craziness is a solemn line of faithful holding candles singing the ave maria you're never going to get that out of disney ever again it's one of the most beautiful beautiful things to the original and just seeing this again to see the Stalinist government and this d entire armored division trampled by people with nothing but flowers and rosaries and, and, and holy water, I just, I loved, I loved the thought, I just loved these little reminders of what is really at the heart of, um, of having faith. The power there. Yeah. I'm going to go rewatch that soon. Yeah, I, I do remember that scene, but I don't I don't know it in this great. You have to find you have to you have to do a lot of digging and make sure you get the original because you, you uh, everything that has been remastered and re-released, they no longer have Franz Schubert's uh, Ave Maria there. So the, the Ave really? Maria Oh yeah, the, the the newer releases there's no more Ave Maria. Wow. Yeah. You took it out. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you, I'll I'll send you I actually downloaded it. I'll I'll send it to you so you can have the raw file. Um but the original is uh, is surely a get. There's a lot of occult imagery inside of Fantasia, but the fact that it ends that way I, I love uh I, I just love it. Um let me see what else do I have here. 638, we're getting to the end here. The delays give Christian just enough time to confront the Pope and he lays it all out for him lays it all out. He tells him about the enthronement. That's where we realize that he, he did not know about it. That's on page 360, 368. Here it is. Or uh, 638. What am I dyslexic tonight? Jeez. Uh, the aim has been made to, uh, uh, had been made, had to been make one thing possible, Holy Father. Gladstone withdrew the double sealed envelope from his inner pocket and laid it face up on the balcony ledge. Lucifer has been enthroned within the precincts of the Holy See on Vatican Hill. The documentation is all there. Names, the rites that were used, all the factual data. Most of it is in a uh, microcopy, except for the testimony of Your Holiness's recent predecessor and the, pre and the brief inscription prepared by Father Aldo Carnesecca. Carnesecca, the pontiff repeated the name as an exclamation of poignancy and deep regret. He took the envelope in both hands, examined the two papal inscriptions on its face, saw the dates, read Father Aldo's uh, trenchant hand off, uh, hands off warning, read the old Pope's letter. So, he wasn't talking to Gladstone. He wasn't looking at him. He says, I knew. No wonder we couldn't. No wonder we couldn't. No wonder we, well, no wonder we couldn't what? No wonder we couldn't do one thing or another. They were just incapable of being able to be victorious because of this ritual, something that had blocked them. We never got a lot of closure on the availing time. There's a lot of things we haven't gotten closure on. I, I have to think about them a little bit more. But toward the end, now this is where the Pope still almost seemed unmoved, um, as if he was a little bit more despondent that he was not able to... W what can he do? I, I, I think I still may need to resign and let this all go. Maybe the resignation is the will of the Holy Spirit itself in this, um, in this timeline that we're in. And man, Christian, who you know is actually really speaking on behalf of Malachi Martin, is letting him have it again. And this is, uh, this is the, the, one of the last pages on 641. He said, Holy Father... If this uh, was to be a farewell speech, all gussied up in one more of the, the talk signs of heaven, Gladstone refused to hear it. He held nothing back now. His entire being, mind, nerves, heart, soul, was strung out among the thinnest edge of survival. Quote, please do not think of yourself as even remotely included. Because this is where um, the Pope 
referred to himself as Jesus said to Peter, you know, Jesus and Peter, um, where he had to go back and, you know, from what was it, the the, uh, the Via Appia Antica? Yeah, yeah, Quo, Quo Vadis Church. You can go to that church. It's sublime. Yes. It's based is based as fuck as they say well, well that, that's what he said he said these days monsignor christian i have meditated long on how those words jesus said to peter about how and when he became old others would bind him and lead him where he would not choose to go and this is where he says i'm not having any of that he says please do not think of yourself as even remotely included in what the Lord said to Peter on that occasion. Nobody has bound your arms. No one has forced you to go where you didn't want to go. You have simply acquiesced in the results of a greater cunning than you can muster. It is true that you are the lawful successor, uh, successor to Peter, that you are Peter in that sense. It's true that Peter once took it into his head to leave Rome. No doubt that he thought uh, that he thought that best for the good of the church. If he could escape being killed, the church would benefit. And what we all know, the story of how Christ himself met Peter in that headlong flight from Rome along the Via Appia Antica, met him, reproached him, sent him back to his post and to his death. But please, Holiness, there is no way on face of God's earth that your holiness can compare where you are now to where Peter was that day. And um, and it's just about him taking responsibility. And he becomes a little bit more withdrawn, more and more, into himself. And it leaves off, um, you know, it, it leaves off with just us wondering, what, what do you think is going to happen? Uh, Slattery asked Christian, where do you think he comes with us? You th where do you think it goes? And here's the last piece. Just so we have it on the uh, on the record here. Um, let's see here. Here's the, the the last half page. Just since we should put it out there, Chris moved forward onto the balcony again because there's a long time of silence, and the time was running out. He wanted him to get out and go back to Rome, a conquering hero, and really give it to the Satanists. Uh, he raised his eyes to the silent Pope, while uh, while searing questions coursed through his mind. Can your answer? Can this be your answer, Holy Father, to Carnesecca, to Slattery, to Gutmacher, to all of us, silence? Can this be what it all comes down to, Holiness, all your years as Pontiff, all the millions of miles in papal pilgrimages, all the billions of men and women and children who have seen your face and heard your living voice, all the vast rivers of words you poured into so many languages, all the cities you've seen, all the world leaders you visited and who, you've, who have visited you? Is this all it's reduced to, Holy Father, to your secession? or seclusion, I should say, on the lonely hill in southern Poland at the bidding of Christ's clever enemies. Can this really be the will of Christ for you, his spokesman, his personal vicar on, his, on this earth? Can you think that God, who came to be crucified for us, would give you a sign to justify acquiescence in the petty plots of pygmy men, or the darksome will of the nether forces those men serve? God, he's just a great writer. Um, and, and then here's the final part. part. Precisely Where now. Where are you, Frank? What, what uh, this page? is the last page, 646. Oh. 646. And here's the last two paragraphs. Precisely now, Holy Father, is the moment of truth. Gladstone took another step forward on the balcony of Jasnagora Monastery, one step closer to the Slavic Pope. It's not yet dawn, but it's a matter of minutes, Holy Father. Christian's voice was drowned into a burst of extra loud cheering from the crowds. A couple of television crews had made it to, uh, how do you say this? Just. Sestowa? It's a, a Polish... Chestoshua. Chestoshua. And had just turned on their searchlights to illuminate the scene. Still silent, the Slavic Pope lifted his eyes to the morning. The steady drizzle of rain had ceased. The banks of clouds had, lift, had begun to shift, chased by a bright, uh, bright carpet of stars unrolling behind them. But Gladstone had set, uh, had set it. There was no trace of dawn yet in the eastern sky. And that's, and uh, you know, I I know. Well, here's the thing about how it ends. Uh, we know he didn't sign it in real life. Uh, was the resignation plot symbolic or actually happening? I mean, based on what happened to Benedict, uh, what he went through, I would have to say that it was real or it was least in its uh, developmental phases. But what of the enthronement? What of the conspirators? Uh, there was no mass excommunication that I remember. So I don't know. Um, it would have had always been so hard. 
I, I don't know how hard it would have been or if it would ever have been easy to leave us with something gigantic because we know better that what did or did not happen in the years after this was published. And um, certainly uh, the Pope outlived Malachi Martin. And I guess it just lends us to believe that the plotters continue to plot and that their day, one day, will be brief, that the dawn will come. But, um, yeah, that's that's how we're left. That's how we're Wait, left. Is it, is it definitive? A couple, a couple clarifications. Do you think it's definitive that the Pope was not going to sign? Or was this a cliffhanger? I, I To be honest, I think it might have been a cliffhanger in that respect. Uh, we know what ultimately didn't happen. A pope would eventually sign a resignation, but not the Slavic pope. And um, in that respect, I don't know. I think that ri written from the point of view, if you listen to any of Malachi Martin's interviews that he was doing in the mid-90s, he was talking very forthrightly about the declining health of the pope and the Parkinson's and that he is a dying man. That the time, his time on earth is coming to an end, whether it's today or a couple of years from now, however he holds out, and he held out for almost a decade later, from 96 to 2005, but he was talking very bluntly. You can find multiple interviews with him, not just with Art Bell, but with others, about the state of the Pope and what's going on there. And with all of the kind of people that are inhabiting the Vatican that he knew of, I'm sure that he knew of some kind of a thing that they were doing, something that was going on to get him out, um, to give him a, a way out. I, I just don't know uh, the cliffhanger there that might have just been because he was still alive. He thought, he knew that his health in real life was not good, and he knew what kind of forces inhabited the Vatican. So the cliffhanger could have been, uh, you know, it could, this could have been even more of a prophetic book if uh, the, the Pope was actually forced to resign. W what would you think... If this book was the reason why a resignation plot was abandoned, just because it w they didn't want it to be too much of a... Uh, That's true. You know, That's what, what do you think? Yeah, yeah, like a, <laughs> like a causation influencing harbinger. I, look, I, I was having a conversation with a law professor friend of mine at a baseball game who hadn't read this book, and I said, you know, he'd just been at a, at a conference uh, with some guys at the Holy See, uh, important guy, and I was like, "You should read Windswept House." And he said, I, "I never know whether I should or I shouldn't because you know, it, you know, really trustworthy people have told him, oh, he's a phenomenal, fantastic liar, a, a beautiful liar.'" I'm like, "I know. This is kind of what I. This is why I've delayed reading it for ten years, Frank." But it, it, dig this. The book has a real life cast, guys that I happen to know a, a, a fair amount about, professionally anyway. The, the St. Gallen guys, like I said, there, there are five or six of them that are characters. They're some of the main characters. And what's the central question animating this book, if I can do a look back, that's also a, a mode, what we'd call a mode of credibility for in favor of Martin's a prophet and this is, he's not lying, is how queer would it be how strange would it be frank if the same five or six guys that in 1996 were only then forming the St. Gallen mafia when this book was written it was the first year they ever met in St. Gallen Switzerland and their big world historical goal such as to change the pontificate forever was to secure the resignation of not JP2 the current pope in 96 but the successor of the pope actually they said the the distinct goal of the St. Gallen mafia was to prevent the continuance of the JP2 pontificate through Ratzinger through a Ratzinger pontificate which was presumptive hmm. so but it's the same guys yeah. i mean it's literally the same guys in the book and for whatever reason Martin never says it much it's not said in Father Elijah, which has bad guys with basically the same goal. Why would securing a pontifical resignation be such a big deal? Why can't they just get their guy, let's say it's Bergoglio, which is not out of the realm of possibility. Just get him in and institute a, a papal program 
to do all the bad stuff he's going to do. It would look a lot like the Bergoglio uh, pontificate. You see what I'm saying? Why yes. is the securing of the resignation of JP2, which in reality translated to Ratzinger, why is that so important, A? But B, how can one doubt that this book is prophetic when this hadn't happened since uh, we were just talking about it, but uh, 800 years before, 750 years before, and he, he got it right except by one pope off. And it was all the same guys. It was Silvestrini. It was Daniels, who is a character in this. It was Martini. It was uh, uh, the, the English one, who's a minor character in this. Mm. I, it's unbelievable. It's un it is. unbelievable. Do you un I mean, I just don't think – I don't know if this is setting in on people. This is a really big deal. He, he got it right. There's just a few pieces that were slightly off, and it was just the, it was the, it was the next it was the next the next pontificate. It was just the very the next one. I mean, perhaps uh, you know why when you see somebody like John Paul II, who was in really bad health, that was going to be exiting the earth no matter what very soon, and by all measure has not really resisted so much aside from uh, aside from making principled stands on on population control abortion things like that uh, he not really resisted this this uh, ecumenism that we talk about all the time and this globalism um, but the next one where are you going to set the precedent and you know you know this stuff better than I do but the one thing I can say is as well if, if people were ever on the book on the defense of reading this book I always just I would just say hey why not because it's bigger than than just this particular plot even though it has real people and it is explaining a lot of what we're living through today it is a globalist force uh, in the industrial um, in industry and in banking it shows you how banking is um, the the covens here it explains a lot of what came out to be some of the biggest uh, exposures and and uh, and uh, the, the biggest black eyes of the church ever received on on the uh, the account of ritual abuse, right? And what happened to the seminaries and what that has to do with everything. There is all there is just so much there on the the uh, on the lodge, uh, the and the complete stripping away of all supernatural reasoning, and all right. supernatural reasoning for the faith. Uh, remember, th uh, in the first couple hundred pages of this book, they have Sister Lucy completely compartmentalized. And just, just locked away, you know. Don't even bring her out. She's a, a remnant of a past that we're trying to completely wipe away because we're embracing a lot more of a corporate, n uh, nonsensical one-world government approach to things. Um, I know you have to go, uh, Tim. I, uh, if there's anything else you want to say in closing, go right ahead, and I'll just read through the thread on my own, um, and then we can do this again next week when we uh, we we do a little bit more of a uh, a follow up to this stuff. You know, Coolum, right? You, you you want Coolum next week? We or, can either uh, do it next week or the week after. We can take a break and do. Uh, uh, we can do it the week after next. Whatever you want to do. And now, now that this is done, we can just take it whatever pace. Okay, cool. Um, I found. Okay, I think. Do you mind? Thanks for everything, Frank, and and all all you guys out there. Good good job getting through this. It's a massive book. Yeah. Can I read the two paragraphs I think are the most important? Yes. In the entire Please. book. Um, this is on page 600 to 601. It's also the Master Oyani thing when he's talking about the names on the list. Uh, last paragraph on 600. Gladstone was no longer surprised or shocked by the names he saw on the list of the enthronement Satanist people. Nor would he ever be puzzled again by the, I love this, by the presence of so many unsuitable and unworthy critics with their unholy ambitions and their neglect of Christ's faithful. Everything was now explicable. This is how I feel. Of course, such men found no difficulty in forming, of course, uh, such men found no difficulty in forming alliances with non-believers, with sworn enemies of Christ and of all religion. Of course they had no use for the revelations made by the Blessed Mother of Christ at Fatima. Uh, of course they could not wait to rid the Church of the Slavic Pope, uh, which is a very fair and balanced uh, approach to JP2, I think Martin has. A lot of people think trads hate JP2. Martin's very fair. He's saying, yeah, he loves them, so that's why, of course, he's got a supernatural love and a supernatural faith for our Lord. He's just 
kind of weak. Uh, yeah. I think he's very fair to JP Duke. He is. If anything surprised Chris, in fact, it was the names that were not inscribed on the Archbishop's list. Here we go. Chief among the missing on the Roman roster. This is what we were looking for at the beginning of our show. Uh, was Cardinal Cosimo Mastroianni. And yet he too was in it up to his eyes. He won't ever substantiate this. For with the exception of the Sec Secretary of State Giacomo Graziani, the little Cardinal, uh, and that's Cardinal Sedano, who was one of the main suppressors of Vatican, along with Cardinal Bertone, the little Cardinal's closest associates in the Vatican turned up in the ledger. Mastroianni's un swerving obeisance to the forward steps of history and Graziani's dedication to the self-aggrandizement had laid both uh, what the hell is that? Both men open as apt targets for such advisors and collaborators as Cardinal Noah Palumbo and Cardinal Leo Pensabene among others who had sworn that blood oath against Peter at the enthronement. Long sentence to kind of get around how is Mastroianni uh, in it up to his eyes? But I like the previous sentence even better, Frank. The, he's no longer surprised by this, 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 of course this, of course that, of course the other thing. Mm. I, I think that's the most, I think that's the key to this whole long ass novel. Frank. It is. I, I think it is. And it's, I, and, and more so of having a definitive big finale, I think it's more so about just pulling back the curtain a little bit more and just letting people know that uh, whatever has happened and transpired after the publishing of this book, there is a machinery that needs to be understood and how that machinery came to be, it also needs to be understood as well. And, um, and I'm, I, I, it is certainly reading this over the last six or 11 weeks, whatever the hell it was, um, it has certainly given me a, a richer perspective and different perspectives on even analyzing geopolitical uh, activity that's been going on uh, around us right now in 2022. So it's um, I, I, I find this reading experience to be second to none. I had a great time with the whole audience and you, Tim. Thanks for being on again, man. Thanks, Frank. Thanks for everything. If you do keep up with Father Elijah, I read the first 80 or so pages for tonight. I got to bounce right yeah, now. Yeah, go ahead. Man, I, I, I like the the simpler writing style of um, of Father Elijah, but man, he has a, a naive uh, O'Brien, who I've corresponded with. He has a naive take on JP2. I think it's much more, oh, he's saintly, he's really smart, he knows what's going on. Martin has much more his finger on the pulse of JP2, uh, um, which can explicate that pontificate much better. He is good. He loves Jesus, but he is he was way weak and way impotent, probably because of the availing time. But um, anyway, it, it, uh, you, that strikes you within three chapters of reading Father Elijah if you stagger it on top of this. But like I said, when you sent me that two and a half hour YouTube thing, Man, I just feel like I'm I'm seeing uh, with open eyes the, the the world of geopolitics for the first time. And this book was a great aid to that. Yeah, man. Now now you're going down the rabbit holes. I, this is what makes broadcasting uh, a lot better, man. Anybody can go out there and grab some headlines and talk about the headlines. But if you can give somebody something, some hidden history and some insight or something you've heard. A little bit of a rumor, even. Oh, it, ma it makes it so much more compelling. Thanks for everything, Tim. We will, we will follow up again. We'll do more of this stuff in the future. I'm going to read through this thread and get out and down the dusty trail myself. So thanks again, and have a good time with Father Elijah tonight. You too, Frank. Peace. All right. Peace out. There is Timothy Gordon. TimothyJGordon.com. Go and uh, become an avid follower of his. Get into his. He's, he does great things. Great, great great guy, great family, and let's jump into our thread here, okay? So, hi everybody, it's just you and me. First one up, we have from Honest Consequence 351. It says, needless to say, spoilers, I read ahead before last week's meeting. I was feeling some trepidation because there were so few pages left. I've read books before which had a great story, plot, pacing, only to come to a rushed, unsatisfied ending. In a way, I felt that the book, since was dedicated as faction, probably couldn't end any other way. I was searching around for a sequel, but I think that you said it best last week. We are living the sequel. I enjoyed seeing Paul's personal story arc. I felt some closure with him.
him. I think Christian is designed, uh, destined to do great things for the church. Ceci will continue to uphold the traditional church ways and teachings of her network of priests. I'd like to know what will happen to, uh, to other characters. They began to feel like friends. I think that's a sign of a great book. I agree with pretty much everything you said. I miss the... I miss the, the silent resolve of Guttmacher. I miss the, um, the, the, the big uh, boisterous back-slapping nature of Damien Slattery. And man, I, I, I was I was hoping just for a, a little bit more uh, a little bit more back alley brawler exorcism stuff that was going on there because we had <clears throat> we we had a glimpse of that from the possessed priest back in the U.S. But um, but like I said, I, I I think that we've been left with a I think we've been left with a I don't know. I will, I'm not. I wouldn't say a manual, but we've been left with a, a lot just to be able to have, for posterity, understanding something from one man's perspective at least. But yeah, Sessi, that's great. The, Paul's arc was nice. I, I'm glad to see that when Paul and uh, Paul actually helped Christian get around to do his thing, communicate with, through Apple Yard get over there to Russia, or Poland, I should say, and how Paul had told Ceci about his confession. So I'm sure that really pleased his mother to see him coming back into the fold. Yes. Summer 711 says, I love this last section so much, I wish the book would go on for another 200 pages. I agree. The spirit of the people came out and combated evil, as the Poles were there on the move to see the Pope had inadvertently thwarted the Cardinal's plans. Yes, it was as if all Poland were there, headed for a midnight picnic in the pouring rain on page three, 634. Like the night on Bald Mountain from... Get the... Get out of here, Summer 7-Eleven! Summer 7-Eleven brought up Bald Mountain! See? like the night on Bald Mountain from Fantasia, which Frank just talked about a couple of months ago. The la that's incredible. But then again, that's a great, that's a sign of a, an audience, an audience that is in a conversational mode with its host. We've had conversations. It's not just me talking alone in a room. That's incredible. The last sentence in the book there was no trace of dawn yet in the eastern sky. At first thought it was an abrupt lady or the tiger type ending with uh, where the reader must decide what happens. Then I noticed this back on page 299. Quote, A long and tedious and agonizing day was drawing to a close over the heads of nations now. The clear, reliable perspective of daytime was yielding to twilight. Indeed, as far as Cardinal Cosimo Mastroianni and his growing cadre of collaborators could see, the sun seemed already to be rising on their plans. Usually dawn is a good thing, but in this case the darkness is the Pope's enduring papacy, and the new day signifies the takeover of the cardinals slash globalists. Lucifer is the son of the dawn, and the book ends he hasn't conquered yet. Wow. Well, Summer, I hope you show up for book club uh, the second assembly because that is wonderfully insightful stuff and it does give you give us a lot more depth to what some might consider an abrupt ending I hope Tim uh, hears this let's see here uh, Nutmeg Rosie says not the ending I was looking for what a cliffhanger great read thanks for the book club Frank I enjoyed every meeting I did too and I know, I, when, I, when I read it, I said, hmm. I, I even harumphed myself. I went, hmm. That's it? And then I remembered, well, did Slavic Pope resign in real life? No. Okay. So we know what happened there. So dial it back. What are we being, what have we been told? What has been revealed to us through this book? Uh... uh you know, it, it's almost like the Titanic. 
You, know, you, you go to the movie theaters in 1997 to see Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate Winslet in the Titanic. How do you think it was going to end? You already have some kind of insight into where this whole thing is going, but what is revealed to you along the way? Kate Winslet sits. Gardenia B says, I was hoping to see a spark of lion in the Pope. However, Michael played that role well. Personally, I would like to see a second reformation of the Catholic Church, but I don't think any of these players would like my vision of a new heaven and a new earth. Well, no, perhaps Appleyard would. Hmm. Kenzel 12. Kenzel. Kenzel, Kenzel 12 says, As the novel nearing a close, as the novel neared a close and all the characters surrounding the Pope tried to insulate him against the resignation protocol on the Russian pilgrimage, I guess my question would now be of this, is this actually a historical fact? How close was this Pope actually to resigning? We obviously saw it come to fruition with Benedict. Yes. Uh, if you listen to Malachi Martin in the past, it really seems that the last few pages of the book, he really made this true feelings about the Pope known through the dialogue between Chris and the Pontiff. I right on with you there. Um, he definitely takes the liberty to express these conflicting and just ultimately sorrowful feelings about the Pope because there is never any question about the genuine uh, the, 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 the gentle loving nature of the Pope of the Slavic Pope John Paul II but that does not meet the grade necessary to defend the church the faith against all of its um, immortal enemies just as an aside, this book could have easily been made into a film or a miniseries. It's never too late. So glad we have to do this together. So glad we got to do this together. And thank you, Frank and Tim, for such wonderful broadcasts. Looking forward to the next. Me too. And last one here is Moira in New York City. I didn't want this book to end. I liked how Malachi Martin tied up many of the loose ends in the final pages. It was exciting to have Chris collaborating with his brother Paul and Apple Yard in his attempt to save the papacy. The assessment that Monsignor Gladstone gave the Pope in the final scene and his review of all that led to that moment was very powerful. Although not the miraculous sign JP2 was expecting, those honest words juxtaposed against the throngs of faithful Poles outside honoring him as the Pope surely moved the needle. Yes. The Cardinal's plot was thwarted and he ultimately served as Pope till he died years later. Ironically, he outlived Malachi Martin. The story concludes to res uh, continues to resonate to this very day. Wonderful, wonderful conversations that have been done in the chat rooms on Foxhole. Let's see here. Um, Ernest... Ernest St. Charlie says, There is a time to be gentle, but there is surely a time to fight. You're right. And you can tell that that is something that Malachi Martin um, and probably many people like him were infinitely frustrated with the Slavic Pope over. That inability to fight. Poor world. Poor world. Uh, let's see here. Father Aldo was the best undercover whistleblower, said disappointed mom. Yes, there's a, uh, you know, I always, I, I would obviously would love to have an interview with uh, Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano. I don't think I would ever bring up Malachi Martin, though, unless I was able to hang out with him for a while. To talk about the world, to talk about the Catholic Church, to talk about things that might, Leo Zagami, perhaps, Leo Zagami would be an interesting guy to talk to. I have him coming on in uh, 11 days from now. I will definitely talk to him. I'll ask him about Malachi Martin and uh, those who tried to blow the whistle on demonic infiltration. So there's so much there. Thank you to everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you on, on DLive too. I see SoCal Patriot. Um, Remy's having a laugh all by himself. Uh, Tanner the Great. 
Boom, that was good and truth. Well, thank you guys and gals. Thank you so much. I will we'll figure something else. Figure something else out. And this is not done yet because we are going to have a final uh, wrap up with uh, Tim's friend. We'll have more on that in the coming week or two weeks. We'll see. Amazing. Yes. Uh, uh, Iluna Moondrops is amazing series. I had a great time with you all. Amazing. We did it. We had a we did a book club. And we completed a book. And to, for the first book to be 646 pages, I think we have cut our teeth on something substantial. Anything smaller than this, we can destroy it easily. All right. With that being said, thank you. Enjoy your holiday weekend. Uh, keep those uh, your notifications on because I might drop in on you from time to time. And listen, go on over to quitefrankly.tv and settle in for a night of After Our Hours programming that is about to be launched by our good buddy Josh, who is running the boards at the network tonight. So be good to him, be good to each other, and have a very nice weekend.